thanks for joining today's session. And uh, today we are going to talk about extending Kubernetes load balancer using CRDs on different cloud providers. And uh, let me introduce ourselves first. Uh, I'm Wei and this is Srini. We both work on IBM and also in the Kubernetes upstream. I work mostly on SIG scheduling and he works most on SIG testing and SIG storage. And this is today's agenda. First, we will try to give you a whole picture of in nowadays in Kubernetes, how can you expose your internal workloads externally? And secondly, we will try to spot what's the missing piece in the whole picture and what's our motivation to solve this issue. And after that, we will introduce a concept called share load balancer, try to solve these issues. And we will give some demos on different cloud providers and finally we will do a wrap up. Okay, so as a Kubernetes user, I think sooner or later you will come across a problem, which is how can I expose my internal workloads externally? So basically, basically it depends on how, where your workload sits, in a layer four or in layer seven, it has different answers. So if you are running on layer four, your workloads, basically there are two ways. One is called node part service. Uh, for node part service to work, you, first you have to ensure your public IP on your work node accessible from the outside. So, so that you can define a service spec with type, node part, so that you can use the public IP to access your internal workloads. But there are some limitations here. First one is, um, when I mean the public IP, actually, you can specify any public IP associated with any work node in your cluster. So this somehow means you have to expose your cluster via the public IP to the outside world. So it somehow has some security concerns, so if you try to run production workload just this way, I suggest to you to do some extra security actions. And the other limitation is that when you open the part on your public IP, it actually the part is opened on every work node. And also it has some range limitation. By default, the range is from 30,000 to 32,000 something. So this is for node part. Uh, a more viable way to expose your layer four workloads nowadays in Kubernetes is called load balancer. Load balancer is totally the same. You define a service spec with type load balancer. But keep in mind, there's no default load balancer implementation in the vanilla Kubernetes offering. It delegates the implementation to your underlying cloud providers. So, well, it makes sense because to make the layer four network routing efficiently, you have to leverage your underlying network infrastructure's capability so you can do the routing better. So this is for layer four. And uh, if you work close working on layer seven, things are a little different because if it's a layer seven network packet, it has more information than a layer four packet because layer four is just about IP plus part. But layer seven, you have much more information you can leverage, for example, the HTTP header information so that you can specify different rules like uh, the same host name slash different subpaths so that there should be a central component that can recognize this characteristic of your AL7 traffic and get them routed properly to your internal workloads. So in Kubernetes, the different the rules to, to define your incoming request, the characteristic is called ingress rule. So it's an API object. And the central component to get the traffic routed to internal paths is called, usually it's called ingress controller. And ingress controller is usually uh, implemented in Nginx or Envoy. So this is for L7. As a wrap up, so if you are running on layers four, not part of load balancer service works. But keep in mind, I put the word dedicated here in the right picture. So dedicated means you request one load balancer resource, resource, I give you one. And if you request the second one, I'm sorry, I cannot reuse the first one and give back to you because the first one has been dedicated to the first request. No matter the first request is 
that way to someone. So I call it dedicated. So this is kind of one-one mapping. For layer seven, ingress, I call it shared. Shared because you define several ingress rules and the traffic goes into the same central ingress controller. So what you're paid for is just the public IP of that ingress controller. So it's an end-to-one mapping, so I call it shared. So if I look at the picture in the top right, you might be found that there's something missing here. So in other words, how can I expose my layer four internal workloads in a shared way? So that's the problem definition. And in upstream, they usually call it L4 ingress. Okay, so this is actually not a hypothetical requirement. Both the upstream has this, and also we internally have this requirement. So for our internal team, there is a warehouse team, they do have this requirement to, uh, they have a, they have to bundle their warehouse solution to the end user. So basically inside this bundle, they have several layer four services. They have two uh, TCP services the user needs to use JDBC to connect to, and also one UDP service the user needs to use for data transferring. So, so if they use current load balancer solution, they give two services back, create two services, and they get, get two load balancer resources back. That is not exactly what they want. What they want is they create several services and they get just one load balancer resource back. So that I can just use this unique load balancer IP plus different part to access the in internal workloads. So a little like this, I request two, but I do want only one load balancer resource back on different part. And uh, one primary motivation for this is about the cost. Because no matter you are running on which cloud provider, the more load balancer resource you use, the more you pay. And also we want to be user friendly because for example, uh, you package this solution to the user and in, the, in a user's perspective, what I care is just you give, you give me just one solution, right? Why I need to remember so many individual load balance IP and the get connect to, right? Ideal way should be I just give one and I just use that IP to connect on um, different parts to internal different workloads, right? And also, if you want to manage different load balancer resources, of course, you need some extra operation efforts, okay? So we try to resolve this issue and uh, before I jump to the solution, I want to spend more time on this to really understand this problem. So this problem actually has some sub problems at least here. First one is I already have the load balancer resource, right? I can, I can create it by using the cloud provider. But how can I open the part so that I can share the load balancer on different part? This is the first problem. I can, how can I open additional parts? A second one is how can I associate the additional part to the internal workloads? So this is the second problem. And third problem is if those two are possible, how can I give this accessing information back to the end user in a friendly way? Okay, so here is almost our design. So in this solution, the service a low balance service is no longer acting as the very facade to the end user. Instead, the customer resource object is acting as a very facade to the user. So uh, I don't need to worry too, about the, too much about the spec of the CR, and I will mention later. So the CR is, the spec is almost the same as a service spec. So basically you have incoming part, targeting part, uh, protocol and uh, select labels. So when user create a CR object, firstly we will check whether we have available load balancer resource or not. If we don't have, we will try to create a real load balancer object, which is just create a service with type load balancer, so that it do some bootstrapping things and get the traffic works from outside. And uh, notice here, I didn't 
I just opened a dummy part because right now this load balancer is uh, just the dummy one I want to hold here and uh, how to open additional part and uh, what's the specific additional part. The part comes from an uh, internal service I create with type node part. And uh, that node part has specific specification from the incoming CR object which carries, which is just some normal service spec I mentioned earlier. Incoming part, the tagging part, the protocol, and the select labels. I put it into an internal service, for example, as a node part service. And so that Kubernetes gave me a node part. So this node part is a specific part additional part I need to open on this load balancer so that it answered the first problem. Oh, sorry. Then we go back to the first problem. How can I open this specific part? So we have to invoke specific uh, cloud provider SDK to do things, usually do two things. One is open the part itself. The second, the second thing is to open the incoming uh, they call it security group inbound rule. That is sort of a, a firewall thing, make the firewall happy to let the traffic come in. So this answered the first, first problem, uh, which ad uh, additional party should be open and how to open. And second is how to do the association. Association is by uh, using the part to do this. And uh, because we create an internal service, and the last mile will be guaranteed by Kubernetes from the internal service to the backing parts by uh, proxy by the created the IP rules. So by this, we answer the first problem. The traffic hits the load balancer on diff additional part first, and the traffic goes to internal service, and the inter traffic goes to the tagging parts, so the traffic can went through. And uh, Let's go back to the third problem. How can I give this information back to the user? So thanks to the design of CRD, we just put the information back to the CR object. So the user use kube control get CR object and get the necessary information back to get connect to. Okay, then I will do a live demo on Amazon EKS. Uh, so on the EK, because right now I don't have any uh, resources. So firstly, I will try to switch the context to this environment. And uh, e the latest version on EKS is 1.10. And I don't have any other service. And uh, I'm trying to create some backing parts. And CRD definition has been there but the CR object is not there yet. The SLB is short for shared load balancer. And uh, in our program, by default, the capacity is five, but to demo some specific function here, I just set it to two. A capacity means uh, how many slots I want a shared load balancer can serve. Okay, this is the specific definition of the CR object. You can think it has no difference than a normal service spec. It has part, target part, if you don't specify protocol, it by default is TCP, and select label is try to find the targeting parts. Okay, let me create it. So basically, EKS needs almost three seconds to create. Okay. This is the one I mentioned, the load balancer. I want to do the sharing on this load balancer. And uh, the, this part is the dummy part I, I mentioned earlier. And uh, EB, EKS give us a host name. And this is the internal service I mentioned. It's of type node part. And uh, this is the part we need to do, do the association. And also, we set it back to the uh, SRB object, the CR object. But here you can see there's nothing additional information printed because uh, only in 1.7 Kubernetes it has a feature called print additional columns. So for other, other demos it's okay, but here we have to uh, use some other cube control tricks to print the additional information. So here. So external IP has been specified as the host name and this part. Okay. 
Let's take a look at the Elibus console. Okay, this, the Lobanzo object has been created. So two things. We need to open the part itself. In AWS, it's called listener. So the 4001 app has been created. The second thing is to fire, open the firewall rule. So you have to go to the security group. And in security group, here, there is a inbound rule. So here, 4001. Let me create a second one. So ideally, we specify the capacity to two, right? So it's still available to serve another incoming request. Now let's take a look. So I create the second one, and you can see the load balance resource is still one. And the second internal service has been created. And also get SLB, get the CR object. You can see the second line, the external IP is exactly the same as the first one. So that means we have succeeded to use the same load balance to solve two incoming requests. And as of now, we are run out of capacity, right? We are creating the third one to see whether it will create another load balancer for us. You can see, yes, there is another one created yeah, here. Okay. The TCP3, the CR object, is using another DNS host name. You can check here. Finally, let's use NetCAD to check the connectivity. Because unlike other cloud providers, uh, EKS gives you a host name rather than an IP. So you need to ensure the local DNS lookup works so good it works. Let's check the connect. OK, good. It's exciting. So that means the traffic really went through from the outside to inside the pod. Okay, let's delete the first shared load balancer object. So delete it, and uh, there are still two load balancer resources because the first one are still serving uh, the second CR object, right? And of course, the, the first CR object has been deleted. And let's check a little on the screen and the console. Yeah, there are still, you can see here, the 4001, the first one has been deleted. This is the firewall rule. And uh, go to the low balancer itself. Uh, lesson, uh, yeah. Yeah, the 4001 lesson is, has been also deleted. So this is almost the demo for, for EKS. And, uh, let me hand over to Sweeney. Okay. Thanks, Ray. Uh, I'm not as brave as Ray, so I'll probably use uh, a record demo here, uh, or also in the interest of the time. So I would like to show you several scenarios uh, for different clouds. Um, let's uh, start with uh, GKE. Um, on GKE, um, again, you set up the environment um, to, to connect to GKE cluster. Uh, the cluster has two nodes here. Uh, the version we are running is 1.11. Um, there are no other services running at this point, but, but we are creating four deployments on this cluster. So the idea is, what if happens, uh, we are concurrently creating multiple services, uh, would we be able to handle that? Um, so there is a CRD definition already for the shared LB. Uh, we haven't created any instances of the shared LB. That means we do not have any backing services yet. Uh, that means we don't have any um, load balancers in the cluster. So as you can see, the GKE console has no load balancers in there. So let's go ahead and concurrently create four shared LBs. All these four objects now trigger, has to trigger a load balancer to be created. And as you can see, there is one load balancer created. It's a bit slow on GKE to create a load balancer, so let's roll forward by about a minute, and then you will see, all of a sudden, a load balancer created with an external IP in there, and uh, like we pointed out, there is a dummy port created, 33333. But then we also have created four other ports for, for the four services that we created concurrently. 
So in the end, if you see for all the four shared uh, LBs, which are backing the services, they all have the same public IP, and each of them has a different port to connect to the backend um, application uh, we have. Uh, Netcat shows that the first application running on 30,151 works fine, and trying the second application, it works fine. So looking at the console right now, you can see that the load balancer is created. And it has two target poles. That's uh, two uh, nodes that we have in the cluster. And uh, if you look at the front end, there are five forwarding rules. Uh, four of them, uh, one is a dummy rule, and four of them for the four backend services that we have um, having different ports. Uh, also, uh, as you can see, uh, if you go to the network, uh, there is one external IP that is created for the load balancer with all the five, five forwarding rules out here. Um, and uh, we also create a firewall rule. Uh, in this case, for, um, for the proof of concept, we created one firewall rule for TCP as well as UDP, opening up all the ports from 30,000 to 32,767. So um, that's on, um, on uh, On, um, um, let me show you on IKS. In this case, we, I'm trying to demonstrate you um, um, using both TCP as well as uh, UDP service. Again, we create the environment. We have three nodes in here. We are running version 1.11. Uh, there are no services. Uh, we create two deployments, one for TCP and one for UDP. And there is a CRD definition out there uh, already created. So let's go ahead and create a CR object for TCP uh, service. On port 4001, uh, serving on port 4000. Uh, once we create this, uh, we also create a UDP service on port 5001, uh, target port 5000. Uh, we now see that there is a load balancer created as soon as we created the first uh, shared LB. Um, and the IP of the load balancer is associated with that port, 4001. And then uh, we create the UDP service. Uh, we, we see that both the shared LBs are using the same load balancer here, and, uh, but on different ports, of course. Uh, and the information about these uh, shared LBs is, uh, is shown here. Uh, let's test it out, netcat um, to each of these services. Uh, TC uh, echo test to both of them. And when you look at the pods, the pod has that echo in there. So we are able to properly connect to the backend uh, applications that are running uh, behind this. What happens if I create a random port now? So uh, the port is uh, commented out there, for, and we'll see what happens. Uh, if we create this shared LB, again, um, a service gets created. And this service now, as you can see, has allocated a random port for that. Uh, we will create all the required uh, um, firewall rules and forwarding rules for you uh, around it. Uh, quickly, I'll also want to show you AKS um, for a, with a different purpose. Um, Again, in this case, I am setting up the environment for AKS. There are two nodes on AKS. By default, that's what you get with a free account. Uh, running version 11, uh, no services, running in the cluster. And I'm creating two deployments, TCP1, TCP2. There's a CRD defined already. So we are going to create one service on port 4000. And once I create this service, there are no um, load balances at this point in the cluster. Um, so once I start creating that service, I will have triggered a creation of a load balancer. Uh, this load balancer takes a little bit time on AKS. So uh, once it's created, that is the public IP is available, and that's associated with the service. 
uh, shared LB service, and as you can see, the shared LB service is using 4,000. And if I create a second service on the same 4,000, uh, also you can see in the console that this particular load balancer is created, and uh, if you further look at it, um, there, is a, uh, there are two rules, one for the dummy port and one for the port of our service. And uh, um, th those are the two rules. And also you can see there is inbound security rules created for both the ports here. Um, so let's say now we create another service, again on port 4000. What do you think will happen? Because already we have a load balancer serving on that. Uh, this will trigger a creation of the second load balancer for us. We are sharing, but if there is a reason why we have to create one, we would create one for you. And uh, again, we will uh, we'll be able to um, uh, associate that um, IP address with the new service that is created. And you can see there are four uh, inbound security rules created automatically for you. Uh, and that port is accessible for the new service we created. And if you try to create another random port service, at this point, we have two load balancers. We haven't re received the capacity of the load balancers. Uh, we did not re reach that, so we can reuse the load balancer. So uh, the third service that is created with a random port is using the IP address of the first lo load balancer. So uh, that's the three clusters, uh, three scenarios. So. Okay, let's get back to the slides. So basically the demos, we gave the functions actually acting, uh, works on every, does it work? It works on every cloud providers. We just, okay. We just use the, we just demo the different function on different platform to show you that we really have implemented them so finally, let's give some design implementation considerations. So some decisions must be made when they design to get, get it implemented. So first one is we choose CRD over service with annotation as a very front end with the user interaction. So because if you use a service with annotation, annotation is just string, plain strings, key values, they are just tags, unstructured tags. So Using that, you cannot enjoy the benefits of a CRD brings to you, like defaulting, versioning, uh, validation, admission control, et cetera, et cetera. And second one is we choose namespace CRD versus cluster CRD because it's a more user-oriented CRD so that we can also associate with this CRD to our back policies if you're running a multi-tenancy environment. And also we try to create a real load balancer resource on demand rather than maintain a warm pool for the load balancer resources. And also how many uh, requests you can, one load balancer can serve is also configurable. And also we also adopt some best practice on CRD controller. And this is the summary, our summary on different cloud providers. Uh, I think most of them has been mentioned in the demo. And this can be a reference if you are interested in any specific platform. And also, this is not specific to a managed Kubernetes service. So it's actually because we, we just, this solution is based on the underlying cloud infrastructure, network infrastructure, right? So for EKS, the solution actually also works for OpenShift or Rancher or Haptio because underlying, they, are, they are both use AWS, use ECTU, use the, the load balancer resource in AWS. Okay, finally, uh, I encourage you to thinking in Kubernetes way when you do your in-house Kubernetes solutions. So when I want to try to put the things like uh, uh, load balancer CR object, internal service, and the load balancer together in a sequential way, actually I was inspired by the design in Kubernetes pod. If you, if, you, if you know in Kubernetes that when you create a pod, actually the first thing Kubernetes did for you is spin up a pod container. It's a very tiny container. It does nothing but do some bootstrap things like setting up the 
Linux namespaces, setting C groups, so that afterwards it adding the real containers to your Linux namespaces. So in my design, the load balancers resource is actually acting the same role as the uh, pause container. It does nothing. It, it's a kind of a dummy one, has a dummy pod, but it does the bootstrapping things to make sure the traffic can come in so that afterwards we do open the additional pod, do the association. So this is the first story. Second story is when you think the problem, so we want to do sharing, right? It's the problem be becomes from one one mapping to n one mapping. That means you have less resources and you have more requests. So how do you do, you do the mapping? So at this time, so things are different. It's actually a classic scheduling problem. For example, if one load balancer has been occupied by an incoming request on the pod, of course you cannot use that specific load balancer for another incoming request using requesting the same pod, right? This is the pod conflict. It's also a, a classic problem in scheduling, also in the scheduler in Kubernetes. And also, right now we just simply config the end says how many slots you can give for, for incoming requests for one load balancer. But what if the incoming request has weight, means one is heavier than the other. How do you do this? So in Kubernetes, it's a resource slash limits model. So this is the thing you can also follow if you have this requirement. And also, how to do your scheduling strategy. Whether you want your resources to be more allocated and balanced or more being, being packed, right, also. And also you want, for example, incoming request wants to be more coexist with this load balancer or I don't want to be coexist with this load balancer resource. It's an affinity and the anti-affinity issue. So this both have implementation and pattern in the upstream Kubernetes scheduler. So uh, don't need to reinvent where something has been implemented and there are already some patterns. So yeah, that's basically what I want to say. Okay, that is almost all for today. And uh, any questions? Yeah, that's just the scheduling problem I mentioned. So if the first one comes in and there's no resource, of course we will we will try to require one from the underlying infrastructure, right? If an, the second one comes in, we will try to see whether the existing one can solve the incoming one. Then it can, if it can solve one, we will reuse the re low balance resource. Sorry? Uh, you mean the waste creates the customer resource? Right. Yeah, uh, de depending on if you want to use a specific part or you want a random part. So, so it's an additional feature we provided. That is also one reason we choose CRD over service visa annotation. Because if you want to provide this random part feature, if you use service, you might know that the incoming part is a required field in a service spec, right? So that you have to use that specific part and you cannot ignore it. By using CRD, everything is in your control. So you can see, you can do whatever you want. So, yeah, the, the question is, if all the associated CR object has been del deleted, and how do we deal with the load balance resource? Is that okay? This is a question we haven't we haven't fixed not fixed we haven't put code to fix it yet. So my ideal is to put a periodical go routine to check whether we have additional uh, totally available uh, load balance resource. If they are, for example, we can set a ratio. For example, if we have 50% of the load balance resource is totally unused, we can delete them. But in current implementation, there has so only not. the load balancer resource. All the forwarding rules and everything gets deleted. We know that's No. So for the 
you mean the load balancer resource or the CR object? It can have multiple listeners. Yeah. Yeah, we have a created two. So I thought it's uh, always one more than the core actual Right, we create one dem dummy one. And we know that. We already. So. Yeah. Because sometimes it, it's it cannot create load balancers without creating that. Unless you have one dummy one there. Implementation data. I don't, I don't quite understand the benefit of using service type load balancer in this case. Are you, are you also reconciling the, the back ends for each of these listeners independently and reconciling your, uh, your firewall rules as well in, in your implementation? But it, it seems to me that the So the, yeah, the, the motivation uh, I mentioned in earlier, so basically it's about cost, right? So if you want to you, so, so basically if you create more services, you'll get more load balancer resource back, and you pay more. Um, it's just the, you're changing the paradigm at that point, I think. I mean, basically, each deployment is associated with a service, service is associated with the port. So that's, we're not taking that away. I mean, you're still, instead of creating a service object, now you're creating shared LV object. That's the transference we got, so. Um, if I understand your question correctly, did I? So if you have any question, we can discuss offline in the details. And uh, actually, this are uh, uh, not implemented. I just want to yeah, introduce the concept that if it's a scheduled problem, you might have this requirement. So this right now is a hypothetical one, except for the part, because part is very easy to understand. If the parts, you, you can't have the part can get conflicted. Right? And uh, right now, affinity and affinity is in upstream is on the part or node the level. Rather, uh, instead of the resource level, like we created this load balancer resource. It's just a hypothetical requirement. I just put an ex example here. Okay, but it seems like this doesn't implement... Like, no, it hasn't. hasn't. Have, like, these ports on the same hub by the load balancer. Yes. Yeah, so basically, we, we use the implementation of load balance actually. So the resource you use is still the underlying load balance resource, right? So we have the load balance resource. It's created by creating a service with type load balance and it creates an underlying object in the cloud provider. And uh, we just create an internal service. That is the two things we created, and they are associated with on the additional part we created. And then the information was set back to a CR object. That is basically the thing. And we didn't, we don't need to do much on the load balancer itself except for opening part. Opening part means open part and the firewall rules. 
that is the only two things we use the uh, SDK to do things. Other things are all Kubernetes concept. CRD, load balancer, internal service, and uh, yeah. It, depend, it depends on your underlying uh, load balancer. So right now, we just create a default one. But if, for example, your incoming request ask for session affinity, right? We will carry that information and create the load balancer with that specific annotation for you, field, let's say, session. And we can do better scheduling, for example, only the request asking for session affinity can use this load balancer for you. Because if you create a default CI object, means default, you want the default service, you don't care quite about session affinity, we can use other load balancer for you. This is a, well, resource allocation. And uh, actually all the fields in the service, we can actually just carry them and create the load balancer for you. Uh, SDK for CRD controller? Cloud specific so yeah. yeah. SDK, you mean? Yeah, SDK, you mean. Yes, you have to. Because you have to oper manipulate the part and the firewall rule. So this uh, lists some SDK authentication ways from different cloud providers. Yeah, your service accounts and all that. Kind yeah, of you have to prov provide the credentials, of course. Yeah. I suppose that uh, you are using uh, Jump for and Hepler Jump the security group, for example, the yeah. you know, yeah. 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 security groups against attacks. Yeah. 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 So basically, cluster IP doesn't work. Because, for example, in AWS, if you want to open the additional part on a load balancer, that part should be opened directly on the worker node. So how do you do that? The only way I can think of is, is using the node part service, because it can open the part. It's open on the instance, rather than inside the part. Sorry, inside the part. And, uh, uh, don't confuse with the security concern I mentioned because uh, the internal service created here is just an internal service. You don't even need to the work the worker node to have a public IP. Just private IP is totally fine. We leverage the internal service with node parties by two things. One is it can give us a node part open on the worker node, and also it will carry out the rest of the things, the routing, IP tables, rules, the can probably we handle that. So security, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, quick question, why did you choose to implement it in like CRD versus changing role zones or functionality on Kubernetes itself? So by default, so the question why I choose CRD rather than modify the load balancer function. So <laughs> this is a good question. So basically, Load balancer doesn't have default implementation. You, if you want to change different implementation, you have to change every implementation on every cloud provider. So what we are trying to do is create the uniform solution. Not uniform solution, but uniform concept and a uniform interface to try to solve this problem. If we go directly to modify the implementation, that definitely quite makes sense and because it's just, yeah. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, so your question is for ingress controller. Yeah, yeah. My question is, is so you clearly talk about the airport just for L4, but even for the L7, they can also share on the same load balancer. 
for L7. Yeah, that's doable because basically, if the traffic, if your solution work for layer four, of course they work for layer seven. Yeah, but it's just that we already have more elegant solution for L L seven uh, because we have L seven packet has more information, right? You can better distinguish the incoming request, and actually in Monday's uh, I think contribute summit, yeah. Brian Guan. Yeah. Any more questions? If not, thank you very much for joining. Oh, there's Sorry. one more. Sure. So in your examples, you had all the services where you were main phase, but can you share what you did for your main phase and how you chose the services in different main phases? So basically, they still work on the same cluster, but they can, of course, can. Can, can be created in different namespace. Yeah. So, so basically, this is just a sample. So we create everything in the default namespace like you see. But a better, more secure way is that the load balance resource and the internal serial resource should be transparent to the end user, right? It's better to put them in a namespace called, a, for example, cube system. Only the service account, your CRD controller, has that authority to access them. Right? And the CR object, of course, is a user oriented. They can manage those. Yeah, this, yeah, this is a good question. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, everyone, Thank you. for joining us.